Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. You've come to the right place. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. Several years ago, my husband had a really interesting exchange with a colleague at work. The young man was recently married, and he came into the break room visibly upset. He had had an argument with his wife and was sure that he was right. And all the men in the room said, in unison, it doesn't matter. And all the women who were in the break room knowingly laughed. Now, this scenario repeats itself over and over again in many relationships. This insistence on being right leads to many arguments and actually undermines a lot of the relationship. So why do so many of us continue down this path? Well, to answer that question, I'm joined by psychotherapist, author, and the host of the Possibility Podcast, Mel Schwartz. Mel, thank you so much for being on the show and talking about this, and I love the name of your podcast. (laughs) Well, thank you, Leslie, and thank you for having me on your show today. Um, My focus is on possibility, Uh, Mm -hmm. my new book, The Possibility Principle. You know, our life when we were young was all full, hopefully all full of possibility. And as life goes on and we get older, the possibilities start to narrow, and that's depressing. And (laughs) I've learned it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, well, that's, so actually, my that's work, actually true, yeah. Yeah, so my work is devoted toward um, reopening possibility into our lives. Well, and that's a really interesting thing because you talk about possibility and, and I'm talking about what, what got me to this was, your, was a recent podcast of yours about this need to be right. And I remember um, several years ago I had a client come in and he flung himself on the couch And he said, if I do what my wife wants, she wins. And I went, okay. And they were in this middle of this back and forth tug of war, who's right, who's wrong. And I'm thinking, oh, how do we unpack this? So where does this compulsion to be right, this need that I have to be right, where does this come from? It comes from the way that we are trained to think. And without getting too academic or philosophical, Aristotle gave us what's called either-or thinking. It's oh. either this or it's that. Mm. It kind of divides reality up into two separate parts. So if you're right, that means I'm wrong. And it doesn't feel good to be wrong. But this compulsion to be right is based upon believing objectively that there is a right and a wrong. You see, we get stuck in 17th century thinking, Leslie, which taught us that reality is objective. And if there's an objective <laughs> reality, there's a right and there's a wrong. Well, Interesting. and our language, our language is rooted in that. When we speak objectively, I am right. That's an objective statement. As opposed to being able to say, I see that differently than you. See, that's a subjective statement. When we speak and think, expressing our subjective perceptions, we get past the right or wrong. But let's come back to the question, how did this come to be? Well, that reality, the way we've been trained to see reality operating works that way. Do you love me or not? Is it night or is it day? Look at the words and the expressions. I've trained my mind differently. So instead of thinking either or, I've trained my mind to think either and or. It's more inclusive. So if we watch where our thoughts go, Mm -hmm. and they tend toward making this division of all things, who's right, who's wrong, Um, watch your thought. That's a false category. Yeah, that's really interesting because I remember when I was um, back back when I've always been really fascinated by the brain and psychology and all this stuff. And so I, just going back to that, to that very basic question that we all get, is it nature or nurture? And my response is yes, it's, it's both and. You can't separate them. That is all... exactly right. That's brilliant. When people ask me either or questions, 
my answer is yes. I <laughs> won't let my mind divide. That's brilliant, Leslie. That's exactly the way to go with it. Because, I mean, you know, and, and, and I, I end up with um, you know, these people, you know, everybody likes a simple yes or no, this or that. I mean, it does simplify life if there are only two choices. And I'm always telling people, it's like very few things, in, in my opinion, are black and white. I tell people two things are black and white. You're pregnant or you're not. You're dead mm-hmm. or you're not. And then I qualify that last one with, well, if you're a fan of The Princess Bride, then you can be mostly dead. And, you know, but right. it's like everything else is a shade of gray. But that makes people so uncomfortable, this idea that there isn't this very definitive way of looking at life, which – bizarrely, I always tell people I'm just kind of this weirdo from Southern California, um, that I kind of like more options. <laughs> I you kind know, of like the, the fact that it's not this way or that way. The richness of life is engaging the complexity and the nuance. And as a culture, we're taught to avoid confusion. <laughs> um, I look at it differently. Not a lot. I, em- I, I embrace confusion. I would not buy a book if I knew to begin with, I would immediately understand everything in the book because then there's no new learning for me. So, you know, as a culture, educationally, the teacher asks a question. If you have the right answer, the kid raises their hand. It's uh-huh. all an exercise in nothing. Imagine an educational system where you're – Get, you get a better grade for asking the best question. And the best question doesn't immediately have an answer. So we get into this wonder and complexity. We play with not knowing. We have to become comfortable with uncertainty. And that allows us to get past right and wrong. Right. And unfortunately, human beings, as I've learned over the years, do not like uncertainty. Like, tell me yes, tell me no, at least it might not be the answer that I want, but then I at least can go on. And so I do think that that's, you know, I I love your explanation about how, you know, this this simplifies life, makes it it less complicated, but in, in some respects, but it actually makes it more complicated because, when we go out into and, and get into these romantic relationships, and quite frankly, it's any relationship, but because this show is about marriage, that's the one I talk about. Um, you know, how does this need to be right, um, this, this need to just put things in zero, one, black, white, yes, no terms, play out in relationships? Well, I've often um, asked people, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? Of course, they say they'd rather be happy, but they default to the right. Um, you know, <laughs> well, the, the actually, they want to be right and happy. It's what they, they yeah, want to be happy but, but, be right. <laughs> but, but being right. But the need to be right precludes being happy. And if I need to be right, that means I need to make you wrong. Now, if I need to make you wrong, how's that going to work out in our relationship? So your point about uncertainty is, is, is very illuminating. Um, uncertainty is the nature of my new book, The Possibility Principle, and the TEDx talk I gave, which is when we avoid uncertainty, we get locked in and we become anxious um, and we become fearful. The embrace of uncertainty, the not knowing, can be a wonderful exercise. Oscar Wilde said uncertainty is the essence of romance. Ah, that makes sense. So the opposite would be then certainty or predictability must be the death knell of romance. See, our whole relationship here with confusion, with uncertainty, it's the wrong relationship. And that's why we get narrowed into having to be right. That's really interesting because, you know, my husband and I have been together for almost 34 years and sometimes one or the other of us will do something and and the other one will go, whoa, where did that come from? Who are you? Because we would think after 34 years together, we would know everything and we don't because he's still growing individually. I'm still growing individually. We're growing as a couple and it's kind of like, oh, that was new. Where did that come from? (laughs) And sometimes it's Sometimes it, it's not done with, oh, that's, that's terrific. It's like, what the heck was that? <laughs> sure. We, we need some surprise and some wonder. If everything's predictable, then we don't need to be present. We're not really here. 
well, that's an interesting concept. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and it goes along, and, and I know that this, co- this quote with, for George Patton kind of gets, um, it's not exactly what he said, but it's the idea of if, if, if two people agree on everything, one of them isn't necessary. <laughs> so, uh, but, but how, I mean, you, you talked before about this idea that if one person has to be right, that therefore the other one has to be wrong. Um, that I would assume would be creating all kinds of problems in relationships because nobody likes to feel like they're wrong. It's, it's, it's destructive. So again, we're coming at this because we believe that there is such a thing as an objective truth. Now, I'm not proposing, I'm not a proponent here of, of fake news. There are <laughs> things that we can, we can objectively agree to. Mm-hmm. But human relations are a matter of subjective experience and perception. So we're using the wrong language. Um, much of my new work has been devoted toward language. How do we stop making objective statements? Well, instead of saying you are wrong, look at the word are. It's a to be mm-hmm. verb. It sets up the divide between right and wrong. Instead of you are wrong, number one, if I say that, I know my words are going to fall on deaf ears. So I'll be frustrated. <laughs> so right. what can I do? I can mm-hmm. say, I can make a subjective statement. I see that differently than you. Or help me understand how you came to that place. Or mm-hmm. my thought is telling me something entirely different. May I tell you what I'm thinking? In other words, the only way to engage real dialogue is to resist at all costs making an objective statement. So remove mm-hmm. those two be verbs. Don't use the word are or am. You are or I am. That's the end of the conversation. So start your sentence typically with I and speak subjectively. I'd mm-hmm. like to share how I feel. Do you care how I feel? Typically the answer is, of course I care how you feel. Well, then let me share how I feel. Mm-hmm. That can be heard. But if I say you are in a negative way, I'm talking to myself. That's, that's a really in, important point. And I love your use of, of help me understand because that's what I tell people. It's like I'm a, I'm a big proponent of confusion and curiosity help me understand what this is about, or I'm curious about this. And then to me, that's an invitation into a conversation as opposed to what you're talking about with the to be verbs where I'm making a declarative statement of which there is no disagreeing. Yes. That's, so exact, is, that's exactly right. So the key there is resist the temptation of making an objective statement. And the key to doing that is just don't use those to be verbs, is, Mm -hmm. am, are, because they lock us into a divide. You are, that means there's a wall between us. And and I've said something that makes you defensive. So you're mm -hmm. not going to take in what I have to say, so I'm going to be frustrated. This is Happily Ever After is just the beginning on webtalkradio.net. I'm Leslie Dorries, and I'm talking with psychotherapist and author Mel Schwartz about the impact of needing to be right on your relationship. So if you or your partner engage in this behavior, you know how frustrating it can be. But as we're talking today, there is a way out. And if you would like to know how to drop your end of the rope and create a happier relationship, I invite you to contact me and take advantage of my free, no obligation, Create Your Happily Ever After transformation session. You can reach me by phone at area code 919-924-0463. Again, that's 919-924-0463. Or you can send me an email at leslie, L-E-S-L-I, at foundationscoachingnc.com that's f-o-u-n-d-a-t-i-o-n-s coaching n as in nancy c as in charlie.com and I want to get back to this because I know Mel you offer a solution to this you call it the 5% solution so what is the 5% solution and how does it work when you're in um, let's call it an argument or some form of it The tendency of our thought 
is to find the things that the other person is saying that we think are wrong and refute them, prove that we're right. Sure. Mm-hmm. That, that tendency is destructive. So okay. in, a se- in the therapy session I was conducting, um, I came to an insight. And that insight was I said to one of the parties engaged, I said, listen, while your wife is talking, I want you to find some small percentage of what she's saying that you might agree with. Let's just arbitrarily call it 5%. It doesn't have to be okay. 5%. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean you're surrendering and pleading guilty as charged. Find some small percent. So he struggled to do it. It was counterintuitive, but he did. And he said to her, well, you know, I do feel badly about having said that to you in the past. I understand how that's hurtful. Now, he has just affirmed and validated her, which can potentially shift the energy of the relationship. Absolutely. So she then looked at him and she said, okay, thanks. But, and she started to go right back into it. So I had her pause. I said, well, wait a minute. He just validated your feeling and an issue you had. How does that feel for you? So she slowed down and she said, well, I feel heard and I feel better. I said, okay, now that you feel that way, can you be more present to take in something that he has to say? You see, the 5% rule is we all want to be heard and we want to be understood and hopefully validated. We're not going to be successful doing that unless we first can validate something we are hearing. It's kind of like foaming the runway. You know, when the plane's come in for a crash, uh-huh. you foam the <laughs> runway. Well, we need to foam the w- runway in communication. First you validate, and then you can educate. What I mean by that is first if you validate and tend to the other person's feelings, then you can share some information you want them to take in. So the timing is pivotal here. It's okay. counterintuitive, but it's simple, and it works. The 5% solution is search for something you can agree with. Temporarily suspend the 95% you don't agree with. We can get back to that. But when I get back to that, I want to get back to that with an audience that's prepared to take in what I have to say. Therefore, I have to take in what they have to say first. If I go first, then I can be heard. And that's the whole goal, isn't it? Well, and I love that because that is usually, and I know you've been doing this for a while and I've been doing this for a while, that is usually what people want. It, it, yes, it would be nice if my partner agreed with me, but first and for, foremost, I want to be heard and validated. And I think that this can be, this can be the complication because, well, and one, the presentation is tremendously important, so I love your concept of not using the to-be verbs um, because that's, people feel like they're attacked, and that's what I tell people. I said, don't use you in the first three words of a sentence unless it's I love you, you're wonderful, I'm glad you're in my life. But when you say you are or you always or why did you, it's like, oh, okay, shot across the bow. Um, and people can't listen. And so I, I really appreciate the introduction of this concept of the to-be verbs because they do the same thing. And it's how do we calm ourselves down to listen and look for that 5% because we're so attuned to the negative. The negative is so powerful. We want to – nobody wants to look bad – especially not in the eyes of their partner. And then, of course, if you've been together for a long time, we build up this, I don't even know what to call it, you, you build up this, this skin of like I'm always wrong, so I'm always looking for the, the, the criticism or the correction or whatever it is that my partner is going to be throwing at me. And it's hard to calm down and find that 5%. So how do you recommend that people do that? Well, What you're leading toward is how do we learn to become not reactive? Ah. So so to not react, and it's just the difference between reacting and responding is just a second, literally. So the way I have learned and how I teach people to not become reactive 
is the first thing you have to do is you have to notice your reaction. You have to see mm. it or feel it. For instance, if I say to you, you know, what you just said made me feel angry. Let me explain to you why I'm feeling angry. That's an absolutely appropriate conversation. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that I'm feeling angry, so I don't have to act angrily. Now, if I don't notice it, I'm acting angrily, and we're off to the races. We're getting nowhere. So mm-hmm. notice what you're feeling and communicate what you're feeling. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling misunderstood. Communicate what you're feeling, and that becomes responsive rather than reactive. That's it. So, it takes yeah, a so, moment. We, see, we can do the same thing with our thoughts. If I notice what my thought is telling me and say, you know, when you said that, I had a thought come up. Let me tell you what my thought is. That's becoming subjective representative we're out of the battle of right versus wrong and i love that and it's so funny because i was having this very conversation about reacting and responding versus responding with a client last night and you and and again it's just that moment where i could catch the emotion before i act on it but is there a way to teach that because you know, it, was, it was interesting because I was talking to him and I was saying, you know, we all have but I, you know, if, if you ever watch any movies or play or, or do poker or whatever, people talk about a tell. There's always something that you know, we pick up from another person where, you know, they're bluffing or whatever. And I said, we all have a tell that we're getting reactive, whether it's a, you know, a flush, you know, we feel our face gets hot or we feel tension somewhere in our body. And I tried to tell people, I said, you need to get really familiar with your own bodily, your, your physiology, your physiological re, re, reactions. Is there, is there a way to help people do that, to understand that, oh, I just got angry or, or I'm in the process of getting angry and let me – well, let me think about that. Let me respond to it instead of react to it. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. Well, I do. There's an entire chapter in my new book devoted to this, Leslie. Yay! Which is, <laughs> um, which is it's creating a muscle memory where I teach the reader to, under, to be able to see your thought and see your feeling. See, if I can see my thought and not become my thought, if I can see my feeling and not become my feeling, then there is a powerful, wise, deeply intuitive new sense of me. Because otherwise, I am just the end result of my millions of thoughts and feelings. And that's why we get imprisoned. That's why we struggle with change. But there are techniques, and time won't really allow us the opportunity but just to give the listeners some sense of this here, mm-hmm. um, separate and set yourself to the task in the course of your day to just enumerate, list for yourself. What was my last thought? Ah, mm-hmm. see it. Don't judge it. What was my last feeling? Oh, I see. And then look at how your feelings and thoughts interrelate. I believe thought comes before feeling ordinarily. So when you're feeling a certain way and you want to know why you're feeling a certain way, ask yourself, what was my last thought? Ah, there it is. So that thought set up that feeling. When you do this, you're growing by leaps and bounds because you can see this automatic process of thought and feeling that directs your life. Now you can begin to direct your life. Well, and I love it because in the example that you were talking about before about I feel angry, which I think is, um, you know, and of course in communication we're always talking about I statements and and it's not like I think you're a jerk. That's that's not an I statement. (laughs) But an I statement is more about me and what's going on inside of me. And it isn't you made me angry. It's like I feel angry and here's why. And To me, that's an incredibly empowering position that, one, I'm taking it away from you. You do not have – you don't have the ability to direct my life, my feelings. That's up to me. But on some level, again, 
it's easier to give it to somebody else, even though in the long run it's really disastrous, but it's easier because, oh, if I, if I take it on, if I own it, then maybe that puts me in the responsibility of doing something about it. Well, I own it, therefore I'm in charge, and I can continue to own it or change it. It's up to me. I'm not a victim. Yeah, that's, that's, a, really, that's a really interesting and, to me, like I said before, empowering position. So what gets in the way of people doing this? Is it because they just really don't know? Because a lot of it, I think, a lot of relationships, problems in relationships, I think, is due to not understanding the ground rules, what makes them work, um, well, the, the laws so of relationships. When my children were in high school, I was invited to their school on what they called seminar day to give a talk. And the <laughs> oh, point they I made, <laughs> oh, they stayed, they stayed away from it. But the point <laughs> I made is, it's, it's due to the fact we are illiterate in, in mm-hmm. relationship and in communication because we can't know education and therefore we suffer and struggle. It is not our fault. Our mm-hmm. values in terms of what we teach children are misplaced. So rather, rather than feel upset or to blame or blaming others, we just need to understand we need to learn this most important art form of relationship and communication because no matter how successful other parts of your life, you won't thrive unless you learn to prosper in relationship and communication. And this is teachable. It is altogether available. And I work with couples who have just gotten engaged and they're happy and in love. Why do they come to see me? They understand the daunting odds in front of them and they want to develop the skill set to continue to thrive. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Well, and I love that because this is, this is why I do this show. This is why I want people to understand. There are, this is something people can learn, and I still don't think anybody should be allowed to graduate from high school without a relationship skills course because whether we're talking about romantic relationships or coworker relationships or family relationships, the rules are the same. I mean, obviously there are some differences, but if we can communicate productively and well, we solve a huge number of problems. Like I've said before, it's good communication, it, just like love, is not enough, but boy, you're going to struggle if you don't know how to do that. It, it, effective communication is the core of self-esteem, successful relationships, it is the key to everything, and it is unimaginable that this is not taught and learned as part of our curriculum. I know. It, it blows. It, it does. It, it seriously blows my mind. But, you know, it's like, you know and, and like I said, because this is a life skill. It's, it's not it's just... the most essential life skill. And the success that people can have in their lives when they learn this, is unimaginable. And, you know, and I so love that, you, you know, because people always ask me if I do premarital work, and I said, yes, with anybody willing to do it. But, again, most people are in love. Oh, this is wonderful. Love conquers all. That's all we need. I'm going, I'm a big fan of love, but you dang well better get some skills because the two of you are going to well, disagree. Les- <laughs> Leslie, in an earlier podcast um, entitled Love Isn't All You Need, in which I'm saying, you know, the Beatles' title to that song was wrong. (laughs) We know, sadly, you need more than love. You need to learn the skills to sustain that love. And what could be more important? Well, you and I agree on that. So where can people learn about your book, access your podcast, learn more, because you've got some great stuff, which I, I say we all need. So how can people find you? Okay. My website is melschwartz.com. That's M-E-L-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z.com. Once you're there, you can read my articles. I've written over 100 of them. I have a TEDx talk, Breaking Free from Anxiety by Embracing Uncertainty. And you can read about my new book, The Possibility Principle, 
which is how quantum physics can improve the way you think, live, and love. And for anyone who's interested, I do offer remote sessions, um, work with people all over the world. And I love that, and although I was really excited about your book until you mentioned quantum physics. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, don't, you don't need to know any science. I, I was okay. a C student in science. It's just the principles, which simply are embrace uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Uncertainty equals possibility. Mm-hmm. And reality is inseparable. Everything is interconnected with everything else. And when we learn that, compassion, empathy, understanding, and love prosper. Well, I love that. And so getting back to the topic of being right, I've discovered over the years that most people who feel they are right, as we talked about before, they're not discussing facts, like two plus two equals four, but about their opinions, their feelings, their experiences. So in most cases, quite likely you both are right. And learning to accept this and figuring out how to manage your reactions is the way to have a better relationship. So, as Mel would ask, would you rather be right or happy? And hopefully you want to be happy. And so, ultimately, the choice is yours. And hopefully one of the things you'll choose to do is to keep listening to this show. And so, until next week, stay loving. Stay loving.